As you know, we have been reviewing the gospel according to Matthew, and we have uh, so far covered the first six chapters, and today uh, we will look at chapters 7, 8, and 9, and what I'd like for us to do is obviously um, read through the entirety of the text and then um, have a few questions, open up some dialogue and discussion for those that are on Go to meeting. Please feel free to uh, unmute yourself and and make comments as well. And I would ask anyone that's here in the room, just make sure you speak up loud. No um, disrespect here, but talk as loud as khaki, and that way everyone can hear you online as well. So uh, just a reminder. But if you have your Bibles, turn over to um, Matthew chapter seven, and we are nearing the end of what's oftentimes referred to as the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Technically, I mean, that's just what most people have looked at because he was speaking. It is interesting when you think about the Sermon on the Mount, um, just as a preface before we get started today, it's only if you read the entire thing about 15 minutes. That's what we have in scripture. I would dare say that it probably was much more expounding and talking really in reality when when Jesus was giving this message to his disciples and those that were assembled. It is interesting to me though too, and, and I can't help but think that when you look at the different gospel accounts, the methodology for which Jesus is giving a lot of instruction in this is like what we would call today bullet points, little segments. And I dare say that probably what we have as a reference is probably just an outline of what was actually discussed. There's probably much more detail that he gave, but it probably was an outline form that the three different gospel accounts or four that have this in it, I should say, they probably did it for the sake of reciting it because they didn't have the example that we have or the uh, prop, well, I guess the proper word would be, they didn't have the convenience of you know, writing it down and having it already printed out for them and all that. So they, they would have to memorize this to be able to expound upon it. But we begin the latter part now of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7 of Matthew in verse 1, stating, Do not judge, or you will be judged. For with the same judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but fail to notice the beam that is in your own eye? He goes on to say, How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, while there is still a beam in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the beam out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before swine. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? So if you are evil and know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? In everything then, do to others as you would have them do to you. For this is the essence of the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life, and only a few find it. Beware of false prophets. They will come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. 
and by their fruit you will recognize them. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain fell, the torrents raged, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet, it did not fall because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the torrents raged, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its collapse. When Jesus had finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teachings because he taught as one who had authority and not as the scribes. I printed out the Baroan Standard Bible to read that because I really like the way that the, that particular translation um, goes throughout that entirety of that chapter and and summarizes some of the words that sometimes are a little difficult in the King James to to go through. Um, but we see here on on the screen several things that are listed here in the bullet again format of topics that he covered in that one chapter, instructing people to stop judging, keeping and uh, keep on asking and seeking and knocking. Oftentimes what we refer to today or have referred to today is the golden rule about doing to other people the way you want people to do to you. This whole concept of the narrow gate and the fact that there is a, another gate that is wide that others go through, but there is a narrow that only a few can find and then after finding it, then go through it. Knowing the fruits of individuals, the, the, the warning that Jesus gave that among even his disciples, there would be false prophets, false teachers, people that would be coming to them, looking the part, but inside were not the part. And there's a warning that Jesus gives that these will be among you and you must evaluate based on fruits, actions. And then the final part of this is regarding this parable that he gives regarding the house and what the house is built on. And of course, the house is synonymous in many regards with our personal lives, what we build our lives on and what we, what we do with the words that Jesus gives. I'd like to start off today by asking the first question here, to open up for the discussion is the way Jesus opens up regarding the subject of judgment. What does it mean to do not judge? as he gives this instruction. Well, Dave? Yeah, sidestepping the question, I guess. <laughs> it's a little hard to say because there's other verses, like I was looking up John 7, 24, that says, don't judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Right. So maybe it means unrighteous judgment. I don't know. But there are other verses that make it seem we have to make judgment. Obviously, it seems like you shouldn't judge other people at all from this part. But apparently, there is some room for some judgment. So I don't know exactly what it means. Uh, me personally, I err. Maybe if I, well, I'm sure I err. But err on the side of not judging at all. So I don't know. <laughs> I think it's interesting that you're, what you're saying because there are a lot of 
other scriptures. And when we study scripture, what we talk about all the time is taking things in context. If you looked at this one verse or this little section here and this section only, then that would be you don't judge anybody about anything. But we do know that we are to judge with righteous judgment. And when we put other scriptures together with this, it seems that it is more appropriate to say that we can judge fruit, just like he says regarding the false prophets, and that would be among you, that you judge them, and that tree is by the fruit. So there is a judgment aspect, but judging an individual to the standard of your own personal ideas, as opposed to God's standards, that may be more what he's talking about. Leanne? Well, also in verse 2, and it says, with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. So often you can be so busy looking and finding fault with someone's decision or what they did that day or what they said, mm -hmm. that it takes the focus off ourselves. And a lot of times what we judge them for, we are the ones that are doing it. Right. We get so passionate, so angry, but maybe we were the ones that were doing it. We wouldn't transfer that on to someone else. Mm -hmm. Steve? I think also humanly, when humans judge their human motives, right. maybe just way off, probably coming from somewhere inside the cell. Yeah. And that's dangerous. And I think that's the, the concept what Dave is talking about with righteous judgment. We can have our own judgment, and we oftentimes do. But usually, even within us, whether we like to admit it or not, there is a bit of a motive behind it. You know, we use the term, there's an ax to grind. And there's some people that have that and they will take their own ideas and they'll put it on someone else as, as, as opposed to God's standard. And I, I think that's why Jesus later would say judge with righteous judgment. And that means there's an unrighteous and a righteous judgment and you're going to judge, but if you're going to judge, make sure you're using the right standards, not the wrong standards. I read, I found this, and, and I think this is a pretty spot on idea here. It says, do not judge or do not be the judge. Don't use your own opinions and thoughts or standards to judge others. Of course, this person says that God is the judge. We know from John 5, 22, that judgment is given to Jesus. And the Father judges no one, based on what Jesus said with his own words in John 5, 22. So Jesus is the one who actually is the one that will judge a person. And thank goodness for that, because I'll be honest, I don't want, first of all, to be the person that makes a judgment on someone else, because I know my judgment is pretty faulty. And I don't want to be judged by anyone else, because I don't have a lot of confidence in anyone else's overall judgment either, to be perfectly frank. So I think, you know, we, 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 that's where we get away from our own ideas. He goes on to say, God is the one who decides what is right and what is wrong, not you. This means you should not use your own ideas to judge other people. For example, you shouldn't fault another believer for wearing shorts to church, you know, or a woman for wearing pants to church. Of course, I know in some denominations, that's a big issue. It goes on to say you should not judge someone for drinking a cup of wine or beer. You should not judge someone for sending their child to a private school instead of homeschooling. It goes on to say, this doesn't prohibit sharing your opinions with others. What it prohibits is you're making a judgment on others by your own opinions and thoughts. Um, and I think that's pretty succinct and pretty good, pretty good idea there that's articulated. Kaki? Right. So that righteous judgment to me means I, I should not be fault finding or to condemn another. And I think that is backed up, I should say, by the verses four through six when he's talking about you are trying to look at someone else 
and identify what their errors are, their faults, as a, and a, he's using the analogy of the board being in your own eye or beam, and then the speck in someone else's eye. We like to mitigate and, and minimize our own faults, but we love to just pick on someone else. And apparently he's using the idea of the hypocrite being that of the Pharisees because obviously they must have been quite apt at doing that as too. Mr. Vogt. I think, excuse me, I think probably a lot of our judging could be done with ourselves rather than spread the word about how bad and how faulty someone else is. Yep. Um, programming it to ourselves, we could benefit from that. Yeah. If we go out and spread the word about well, Mr. Jones is or that. That gets things tangled up quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, we have other scriptures that reference being a talebearer. Um, obviously, that must have been a problem within the New Testament church because Paul references that in a couple of different church um, or letters to different churches, I should say. And so, you know, it's just a human condition, even in the church, that individuals are going to try to, and in essence, whether we cognitively think of this or not, what we're really doing is we're trying to make ourselves feel better about ourselves by putting down someone else. That's what we're really doing ultimately in this kind of exercise. And, and you know, this particular person that I read his, um, chat, his uh, paragraph regarding, you know, women wearing pants or whatever, and someone drinking a beer or someone having a glass of wine or whatever, uh, you know, you, you can, you can look at that, and some people have issues, no doubt. But, I mean, think about the keeping of the Sabbath. There are certain individuals that take their standard of what they think should or shouldn't be done on the Sabbath. God gives us enough for us to deal with. But, no, we have to add to it, like the Pharisees and Sadducees did, with their whole plethora of rules about everything. And the Sabbath was one of them, but many things. And that is the same type of thing where this you're using your judgment to judge someone else as opposed to say, well, you know, this is my opinion. This is what I think. And but instead of doing that, someone saying, oh, no, you're breaking the Sabbath or you're doing this when it's not an area that's clearly articulated by Scripture. Bill. I, uh, I'm going to share this um, in, with the thought that it's going to be hitting home for a lot of people other than myself who hear this. Um, but, you know, it's part testimony that when the Lord finally opened my eyes starting to work with me 12 years ago is also the time in my life when I was prone to judge others because their eyes were still, were still shut. And it started with my family. And I kept thinking, how is it that you don't see this? It's right there in black and white. Yeah. And then I think very quickly, well, how was it that I didn't see it for the very longest time either? Right. So I had to learn not to judge others because of that. Yeah, I think every one of us probably see that, you know, whether it is someone like myself being a second generation Christian, you still look at other people in your family, extended family or whatever else. And you're like, I remember having a discussion with my grandmother one time and and later I thought, you know, I, I was frankly very disrespectful in the way that I was talking to her about religious matters, like I knew something, being a young punk teenager. And I can't help but think sometimes many of us, even after years and years in the church and having God's spirit and everything with us, we tend to be spiritual teenagers and run out there and try to tell people all their faults and their errors. And we're like I was with being a young punk to my grandmother, very disrespectful to people. Yet we think we got the word behind us, but the way we do it is very disrespectful and wrong. And oftentimes it starts with telling people what they're doing wrong, as opposed to trying to be there and help encourage and build people up. We want to tear them down. And I think that's a, that's a part of it too. I, uh, verses 7 through 11 to me back up exactly what you're saying. Those verses show God's generosity mm -hmm. to, to us. And likewise, we to, we're to extend generosity to others. 
Yeah, it's uh, you know, you think about the the whole concept uh, there listed regarding treating others the way you want to be treated. And you really think about that now. You know, you probably we've all been taught that as a kid, and and a lot of words have been articulated, but the concept obviously comes from Jesus. And when you really kind of marry up verses one through six and verses seven through twelve, it really reaches a point where you realize you think you're a, a person that can judge people and yet you're still needing to ask for instruction and ask for that righteous judgment and not judge the way you judge but judge ask to judge the way god judges an, a, a situation and as a result of having that you ask and ask because you don't have that's why you ask and if you ask and seek and find and I, I, I say this, this is my opinion. When we look at the, the scriptures and the, uh, the law, and by that I mean, you know, what's listed in the Torah, what's listed in the statutes and judgments, those concepts, not every particular thing there, but those concepts are a window into the way God thinks. And that's what we want to do. And that, we have to seek that by studying. We have to ask for it by praying. And by doing all of that, we eventually reach a point, maybe, through to, to the point of spiritual maturity, where we were able to treat other people the way that we want to be treated. And yet, you know, sometimes it can be a little bit of a paradox in the way that we treat others. Um, and I think those two kind of segments go together. Um, but, you know, it's just my personal thought. Regarding the, the narrow and wide gates, any concepts or thoughts that, you, that hit you about that? I mean, I think most of us can look at that and we think when we look at Scripture and we look at, let's just say, what's my term, cultural Christianity, Christianity in the world. We see a lot of varying opinions and we see everything from, you know, easy Christianity to ultimately hard Christianity. And I think sometimes when you think about that, um, you know, there is a broad way that's listed in the world. And, and I can't help but think the reason why there are few that actually find it is because John 6, 44 says, no one can come to me, Jesus says, unless the Father draws them. So there's only a few that find it only because God gives the understanding, the Father calls. Now, the individual, I think, has to respond. God, the Father, is not going to ramrod someone through. So we do have a, a, a part to play as a gatekeeper to accept and respond. But even a person that God's not calling, no matter how much they study, no matter how much their will and desire is, they're not going to find the way. God has to be the one that makes that judgment. And that can be disconcerting, I think. David? The, uh, this verse it says difficult is the way that flies in the face of the health and wealth <laughs> doesn't it yeah mm -hmm. it really does <clears throat> Bill what about people all over the world who are practicing a worldly religion no matter what it is Hinduism, Buddhism, whatever and are they doing so thinking that or they are doing so, thinking that they're on this narrow way, this narrow path. Because no one wants to go through practicing a religion thinking that they're living a lie, no matter what it is. And there are so many ways to lead a person astray because Satan is busy deceiving the entire world through all of these worldly religions or whatever it is. Yeah. And there is only one narrow path. And I know that everyone in this room, the sound of my voice, is a truth seeker or you would be here. And if by some revelation you found out tomorrow that you were on the wrong path, you would be the first one to jump ship and make sure you're on the right path. I, I, I agree with that. But I guess the one thing that I would say is a little different um, in my thought is considering that Jesus is the one giving this instruction, I'm not so sure that other world religions would necessarily pay attention to what Jesus taught, maybe from that perspective. Um, not to say that they, they probably like 
Muslims or Islam acknowledges him as a prophet, but I don't think that they would look at him as someone to follow as much as they would look at Muhammad the prophet. But I think that within Christianity, or in my term, cultural Christianity, you do see a broad way. It's oftentimes, you know, easy salvation, cheap grace. There's a lot of things we, we have to sometimes refer to, and I think that is a part of this as well. There's a lot of deception. Steve? In the uh, New American Standard Version, of verse 14, it reads, For the gate is narrow and the way is constricted that leads to life, and there are few who find it. The thing that pops into my mind is that the cultural Christianity says the law is done away. Yeah. There's nothing constricted. Yeah. Right yeah. The law sets orders and guidelines. Yeah, I think that's a, a valid point, too. Um, particularly today now you know you think about it the message that he's giving to to people at that time they would have been in an environment where judaism was obviously the heavy influence but you know i think sometimes and and this is I, i'm just theorizing here so i want to state this as, as an opinion and thought sometimes we think that everyone that was in the area there were all as we would say devout jews and by that i mean devout judaism it could be that there were a lot that weren't. You know, they, they would acknowledge they would, yes, keep the Sabbath and all that, but maybe they weren't that devout about it. Um, we see, And the reason why I say that is you look at the example that Jesus gives with the Pharisees and Sadducees and Corbin. You know, they would give to the church only to be able to get it back. So, I mean, there, there was a form of religion around there, but it wasn't affecting them. And, of course, we know that in many cases it was all about, as it is today, money, following money, power, prestige, whether it's what we see in the political arena and the governmental areas of today's world, or even in religious worlds. I mean, it's all about controlling and power. And in this case, you know, they don't want anything to constrict them for, from their movements, their activities, their power, their money, and all of that. And I think that that's, that plays into some of this as well, about this narrow way. That there are a lot, and because again, I don't think he's speaking to people that at that point were, you know, uh, offering their children to, to Moloch or, or, or things like that. But, you know, he, he's speaking to people that are in Judaism. And, uh, and I think that narrows it down a little more, too, as far as concepts and ideas. What about the section regarding being aware of the false prophets in the trees? I know Leanne alluded to some of that. Any thoughts, comments anyone has there? I personally have always found that a little disconcerting. I will tell you as a second generation Christian, you know, growing up, going to church on the Sabbath and all that and thinking, well, what do you mean? Am I to be really watching that? particular minister there you know you're taught to put all your faith and, and trust and this person's going to lead and guide you and direct you and all of that oh as a teenager i kind of found that a little disturbing to be to be quite frank with you um but i think what you learn as you mature is that you know you understand that there is a reality that is around you not to be naive and to always understand that just because a person says to do something doesn't mean you do it. it kind of goes back to what we've all been taught. My grandfather used to tell me, someone tells you jump off the side of the house, you're going to jump off the roof of the house. And, you know, there's some people that would tell you from a religious standpoint to do something that is very similar in nature to jumping off and doing something rather foolish. Are you going to do it? You know, that's just something to think through. Um, and, and I think he's giving a warning because he uses that in Matthew 24, you know, say there'll be false Christs, false Christs and false prophets. Beware. I've told you in advance they're coming. So have your eyes wide open, I guess, is one thing that I take from that, too. David? So what's, to me, hard to understand about this verse is no person is perfect. So you're going to have some bad fruit in there. Yeah. So... It comes down maybe to that judgment of, <laughs> I don't know, but if you're wanting a, a teacher or a speaker that has no faults, you're never going to find them. Nope. So the one thing that kind of comes to mind is some of these, a, a couple of times in the news where like the pastor of a mega church 
has been caught in leading like a completely double life. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe even a wife on the side or something. And then they get up there and say, well, no one's perfect. You know, I've been imperfect. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but so, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's not just talking about a person. The fruit might not just be sin. I mean, maybe it's, I don't know. It's a little hard for me to understand this verse, to be, to be mm -hmm. honest. I mean, because, uh, like, everybody has some bad fruit, so I don't know. <laughs> Yep. And I don't think you mean to everybody. <laughs> and so, do, do you think proof could be twofold? It could apply to your behavior and uh -huh. attitudes, but it can also apply to doctrine. Maybe. Because mm -hmm. you can have bad fruit yeah. in your doctrine yeah. as well as. Yeah, and, and I think. My commentary here actually says that, but. Yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe. It, it does seem that a lot of the Sermon on the Mount is all about personal um, personal actions and, and, and what you should do. It's almost like throughout this entirety, he's speaking and using the metaphors that we would think of, but he's directing of this to the individuals. This is what you need to do. You need to put this in your life. Um, it's not like a broad doctrinal viewpoint, but... But definitely, you don't need to put wrong doctrine into your life, without a doubt. I mean, it, I think that's very true. Becky? Well, and I wonder as well, though, going back to the first 14, straight from the day, the is the way, that's not really talking about self appreciation that God's true people. Mm -hmm. Because God calls many, but few were chosen. So few they may define it. So that means if you're producing good fruit, which is the result of God's Holy Spirit, you see what I'm saying? So if there's so much more in there as far as the fruit or something from God's Holy Spirit, you can produce fruit through the Holy Spirit. So this is every good tree, so it's a matter of a process of living a person's life, and at the end, are they producing good fruit or are they producing bad fruit? And the false prophets could be could be an individual in the church that's saying things and talking about the end time prophesying, or it could be someone on the world scene. I think mean, it can apply to both. Yeah, I, I do agree with you. I think it, it can apply to both. I think it, uh, you know, it, it does speak to the fact that he's talking to disciples. I think there's some merit to that, and and I think that you know, I think there's always the caution and the concern too. And this is again an opinion of bringing too much of the religions outside even if they're called christian into your personal worship and that's the doctrinal aspects too and you know we've seen organizations do that i've seen individuals do that um and we, and that's not necessarily something that i'm saying certainly looking at the very first chapter or first part of this chapter to say well that's proof that that person's not going to be in the first resurrection i don't know i'm not the one that makes that judgment only Jesus Christ makes that judgment. However, I can look and see and say, I don't want to do that because I know that's a wrong thing, that, that, that direction that's going. Doesn't mean that I'm saying that person's condemned to not be in the first resurrection or in any resurrection other than the lake of fire. I, I, I'm not the one that makes that call. And that's the viewpoint I think we have to say. We can't say, because you know, you if, if you go out on the internet, for an example, I know the internet can be a good thing and it can be a really bad thing. And it, it always amazes me um, a lot of the, my, my words, paraphrasing, just the directness for which many organizations that are Sabbath keeping and may have be splinter groups from what we think was the church, they, they attack each other like nobody's business. And you're like, what in the world? <laughs> it's just amazing to me. It's just amazing to me and how they condemn each other in some cases. Um, is one of those things that if, if, you know, the angels were afraid to necessarily say certain things as we see in Jude, then maybe I need to be trembling lightly on some of the words I say about some other organizations as well. One of the things that I take from that. The last little section there was regarding the, I think, the summary part, that, that the house and what our house is built on. Um, I have this question here, and I'll just put it up to, it says, what do you think this chapter really tells us about being a disciple of Jesus Christ? I mean, one of the things I take is I take this 
this last section that he um, references this house and what is built on is in order to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's not necessarily being able to spout scripture word for word. It's about doing it and living it. Because he says there's somebody who does these things and then there's somebody who doesn't do these things. And we're all going to have winds, storms, torrents, whatever the translation is. I mean, I can speak to that for this past week. We're all going to have it. It's a matter of what we're building on. And what we're building on is based on what we're doing, not what we're saying necessarily. Thoughts, comments? Steve? Christ is no rock. The fall of Israel in the wilderness. There's nowhere else to get to. Yeah. To the Savior. Very true. Anyone online? I know um, Blake's probably got everybody open if they had a comment. Bill? Back to your second question there on the slide. Uh, if, if, the, uh, if our yoke is easy and our burden is light, according to Christ, then why is it difficult to find this way? And I wonder if, if anybody has wrestled with that question. My personal thought is that it's because of the fact that not everyone's called at this time. Only the Father calls certain individuals. Once we take on the way of living that Jesus Christ tells us to take on, it's a little bit constrained, but at the same time, it's liberating. It liberates us from the effects of sin. That's why it's an easier and lighter yoke. But not everyone's going to find it at this time. That's just my thought. I don't was, know anybody else. Was that yoke comment in, in context of talking to the Pharisees? And their excessive amount of rules? I don't, I don't remember. That's one application of it, yeah. I think that's how, though, because just like we started out in this chapter regarding judgment, that's how people can, I think, sometimes not taking all Scripture into account, taking one little section and running with it. You'd say, well, that's a contradiction of terms. He was speaking out of both sides of his mouth. Maybe not when you put it together. But apart on their own two, two statements, two ideas, two thoughts, you might could have that argument. But when you put it together, I don't, I don't think it's contradictory at all. Okay. Well, let's go on to uh, chapter 8. Blake, if you'll click in that window for me. Or advance the slide for me. There we go. I knew I'd do it. Sorry. <laughs> In chapter 8, um, again, we are now moving away from the Sermon on the Mount and we're moving to some events um, that, that Matthew is going to um, articulate and put down. Um, I'm not 100% sure that, you know, these are, even though we have some parallels in Luke, and again, if we want to know the exact order and chronology of events, we go to Luke, because that was his whole idea. Matthew speaks to a chronology to a point, and then he starts going off in concepts and ideas. Just a difference in style and difference in purpose. But we'll begin now in chapter 8, and again, I'm reading from the Baroan Standard here. It says, When Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him, and suddenly a leper came and knelt down by him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing. And he said, be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Then Jesus instructed him, see that you do not tell anyone, but go. Show yourself to the priest and offer the gift prescribed by Moses as a testimony to them. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came and pleaded with him, Lord, my servant lies at home paralyzed in terrible agony. I will go and heal him, Jesus replied. And the centurion answered, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. 
And I tell one to go, and he goes, and another to come, and he comes. And I tell my servant to do something, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and west to share in the banquet with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out in the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, as you have believed, so will it be done to you. And his servant was healed that very hour. When Jesus arrived at Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law sick in bed with a fever. So he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she got up and began to serve them. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to Jesus, and he dro drove out the spirits with the word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took on our infirmities and carried our diseases. When Jesus saw a large crowd around him, he gave orders to cross the other side of the sea. And one of the scribes came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another of his disciples requested, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. When he got into the boat, the disciples followed him. Suddenly, a violent storm came up on the sea so that the boat was engulfed by waves, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us. We are perishing. You of little faith, Jesus replied, why are you so afraid? When he got up and rebuked the winds and the, and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the sea obey him. When Jesus arrived on the other side of the region of the Gardenians, he was met by two demon-possessed men coming from their tombs. And they were so violent that no one passed that way. What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? In the distance, a large herd of pigs were feeding. So the demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out and tell us, or send us into the herd of pigs, go, he told them. So they came out and they went into the pigs and the whole herd rushed from the steep bank into the sea and died in the waters. Those attending the pigs ran off into the city and reported all this, including the account of the demon possessed men. And the whole town went out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. You know, when we look at that story, that is a very interesting story and a very interesting chapter as it's been broken up by man starts out with a healing as we see here of the person that had a disease for which that particular point in time there was no cure you know we may look at that today as being some form of cancer um you know an individual in that world when they had leprosy they were destined to die it was a matter of time it was very similar in nature to what we have with with cancer not to say that even leprosy today couldn't be fatal because it can we see a faith of an individual being healed we see the faith of an army person a gentile by which jesus reference had greater faith than any of the people that he had come in contact with that were god's people and god's people the tribe the the people of judah at the time the tribes of benjamin and judah and they had all the law and all that, but he says they'll be outside where these people of faith, even if they're Gentiles, will be inside suffering with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, an illusion that obviously meant a lot to the individuals he's speaking to. He heals many people of different diseases and problems in Capernaum, and then he asks people to follow him. Some have excuses. Some say they're going to follow and they don't. Then you have this whole issue with 
the storm and the great uh, concern that the disciples had. And yet Jesus seems to be very, very unconcerned about the storm, rebukes them. His own disciples, it appears, didn't have a lot of faith because they're amazed that here's this individual that can do all this. And then we have this episode with demons going into swine of all things. What on earth would people following the dietary laws have with a bunch of swines? And then why would they want someone to leave if that if the, uh, those swines die? A lot of interesting questions and concepts in there. Um, very fascinating chapter. You know, I the first question I've got up here for us to, to open up with is, you know, what happened after Jesus finished the Sermon on the Mount? And what does that tell us about Jesus' ministry? Thoughts? It reminds me of Moses. It says he came down from the mountain. <laughs> yeah. Which, you know, Moses came down. So there's at least some images. Some imagery going on there. Yeah. I find it interesting, the first thing he does is heal people. A part of his ministry is healing, physically people. People in dire and desperate need. We oftentimes like to think of it only in spiritual terms, but he's taking care of people's physical lives. You know, a dead person really can't serve God, can they? The dead know nothing. He's healing people and allowing them life so that they can, can go forward. Mm -hmm. And what you just read shows Jesus' credential. Um, death, he has authority over death, he has authority over illness, he has authority over nature, he has authority over the supernatural. Mm -hmm. So this is another part of Matthew establishing the credibility and the right of Jesus as the Messiah. Other thing that I think is really interesting is that Paul and Jesus both say, to the Jew first. Yeah. The first person to be healed is a Jew. Yeah. And now, uh, uh, not only a Jew, but he is a disenfranchised Jew because of his leprosy. The second person is a Gentile, again, outside Jewish culture. The third is a woman who is disenfranchised by Jewish society. Well, no, the world's culture. Women were not given any kind of status throughout the world as it was known. Mm -hmm. So the first three evidences is he is crashing through all of those cultural and religious barriers. Kind of is reminiscent at the very beginning in chapter one when we talked about the genealogy and how Matthew references the fact that it wasn't a pure line of Jews. You got Rahab, you've got um, uh, Ruth and the other individuals listed and he's the only one that lists women at the same time. And in that culture, you know, it was a male-dominated culture, and uh, I think this is, is following along the same lines as well. Becky? Well, this is interesting, too, is in Chapter 7, he's instructing and lovingly correcting. In Chapter 8, he's delivering and healing. Mm -hmm. So he's kind of getting their attention, you know, from a carnal. He must say, more, oh, wow, he's not only telling us how we should live, but also delivering us from certain sicknesses and diseases. Yep, absolutely. You know, again, I, I think this is uh, telling regarding the centurion and the faith issue. Here you have a person that Jesus even it, it apparently even totally blew him away, to use our term today. He wasn't expecting that, apparently, or at least he alludes to the fact that he wasn't expecting that. He was expecting, it appears, to have greater faith among his own people, descendants of Abraham. And they didn't have the faith that this person had, and faith that the person understood through a chain of command. Um, and it is interesting, I think, too, that you know you have this whole concept of, of a Gentile, someone that uh, exhibits what he's looking for in his own people. And sometimes I think, you know, we realize the church and the whole idea of the church and, and it was never to be that it was only exclusively about Abraham, Isaac and Jacob's descendants because 
the stranger that came among them, even in Old Testament time, assimilated into their view, and they were to be treated with the same amount of respect as the bloodline people were. So, I mean, that was a, it's not like it's a brand new concept that Jesus is articulating. It's the fact that, you know, these individuals had gotten so rigid in their views that they were excluding other people. And sometimes I can't help but think, even in the churches of God, if we're not careful, each one of us can have this same kind of mentality. That we're the chosen precious individuals and that these are just dogs outside. Um, and, and yet, you know, it's not to say that we should, we should be thankful for what's been given to us and have the faith of this particular centurion soldier. I, I apologize. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kaki. Do you think some of the, I'm thinking to the centurion, he was very aware mm -hmm. of the Jewish culture. A part of me says he did that out of respect for Jesus because he knew the Jewish culture was you do not go, you become unclean if you go into a Gentile territory or house. Yeah. And I think it's interesting, the only two people Jesus ever says, I have never seen faith greater than this, is think of Phoenician woman and the centurion. Yeah. I, I do think it's interesting that he, he spends, Matthew spends a good amount of words, real estate on the page, and he's talking about the great respect that this particular person had a humility about themselves. And then you think about it. The centurion represented the individual that was ruling over. And yet he had this humble mindset. Kind of thinks takes you back to Jesus on the night when he washes the disciples' feet. I'm your master, yet I'm showing you how to act. And they were arguing about how who was going to be the greatest. And he said, that's not to be like you. That's the way it is out there. But you, the greater is to, is to serve. I think there's a lot of parallels there. And some things for us to understand. Becky? And with that being said, it seems to me when he, when he says in verse 15, you're saying you come from east and west, those who like this centurion, the children of the kingdom, the ones that was meant for, the first fruits can be cast out in the outer darkness mm -hmm. because they were the children of the kingdom, but maybe they didn't have this humility, this childlike right. attitude we've got to have. Mm -hmm. And and this is again my personal opinion. I want to state these things as I can. To me, I think that's the hardest thing for all of us to learn. We can have a discussion about doctrines and all that kind of stuff, and I got. Honestly, more questions than I got answers, to be quite frank with you. But on an individual, personal level about what my judge, Jesus Christ, is looking for, is looking for the humble person. And that is something that in a world for which we live under the influence of a society under Satan's control, and we have human nature for which Satan can influence as well, it's always the attitude of Satan wanting to vault himself up to heaven, dethrone God. That lack of humility is what has got to be the hardest thing for us to overcome. Just like with Cain and Abel, when Cain, uh, when God, Jesus of the Old Testament, said, you have to get control of this. And that's the hardest thing, I think, for all of us. Any other thoughts or comments? I, I will apologize. I meant to have this in this next question in the next section. I thought I had put it in the right place and I did not. So we'll come to that one next, next chapter. But I would ask and conclude and ask, you know, what does this chapter teach us about being a disciple of Jesus Christ? We had the comment before with chapter seven. What is different about chapter eight that teaches us about what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Kaki? Uh, to me, it's, the key is in verses 19 through 22. Just to follow and go is not a sign of a disciple. You can't just accompany Jesus. You can't just do your religious thing and listen, but it has you have to adapt his lifestyle and you have to produce good fruit to be a disciple. I think he's making a comment about disciples. And the other interesting thing, 
Jesus chose his disciples. In the Jewish culture, the individuals chose their rabbis and their teachers. He did it totally different than what society dictated. The thing that I would add to that is, is the whole thing that we're looking at in chapter eight is a lot of comment, stories, examples of faith. We are required to have a lot of faith in Jesus Christ and, and have the faith in him like the centurion, the faith that you know he would calm our storms. Of course, he's using a physical example, but you know we have the faith to believe that he'll remove mountains out of our life, which he uses a little bit later. And he's not talking about moving Mount Everest, you know, 20 feet over. He's talking about mountain and issues in our life if we will submit to him and humbly ask him to lead and direct us and have the faith that he will provide it. Whether it's physical illness in our life, whether it is, you know, controversies or problems uh, that come up uh, in our life and, and storms that come up in our life. Um, and then the fact that he is in total control, even of the supernatural world, relative to these pigs and the demons. Liam? And the last scripture is in the whole, the whole town wanted to be believed. Yeah. They don't, just because they like what he does or they like what you say, or they like you as a person, doesn't mean they want you around or that they're going to listen to him. Do you think they were Jewish? Because they were fearful of him. I never got the impression that those people, first of all, the pig herders, that wouldn't be yeah. you. They were afraid of him. It doesn't say anything about not liking his doctrine. I just saw, and maybe I'm totally out of line. They, they, were, they were nervous. They were afraid. But I see, I see that as, a, as they're a non Jewish group, not Jewish. And I think even those pigs didn't know how to handle the demons. Yeah. Even they were not able to handle it. I just don't, I never saw them as Jews. I always saw them as non-Jews. I don't have a good answer. That's why I kind of, you know, summarize that this is curious to me. If they are keeping the dietary laws, they wouldn't have pigs for the purpose of slaughter. Now, I have read and heard a lot of ideas that people say, you know, the, these were individuals that would have then sold it to the um, strangers that were lived among them that weren't Jewish people and you know they were gonna I don't know I don't know I just find it interesting I do I find it interesting as well that they go into pigs and pigs are unclean animals so therefore the demons would feel comfortable in that and the whole idea of a demon is destruction so they kill the very vessel they were in um, and it is interesting and telling that they say something to Jesus about are you here to torment us before the appointed time they know that judgment is out there for them apparently I think is one of those veiled things that we see in there. Then, and, and I think uh, it, it, it again to me is a very curious little story at the very end. Steve, I think you had your hand. Yeah, I, I think it's the case that the Assyrians and the Babylonians had brought myriads of different kinds of people to settle in Palestine. In, there were some probably Israelite Jewish areas. The nation of Israel wrong. Right. By this time, I think it was, I think I've even read the Capernaum Gentile dominated. Yeah. Very mixed. Right. But one thing is for sure, I think the reason, and this is a personal thought too, this whole idea of Jesus, um, because of what they saw happen, they wanted him to leave. You know, I think it's all about finances. That was an investment that they had. And because that whole event occurred, they lost money. And it's just like the, the false prophet or the, the, the I'm not, not false prophet, the um, diviner that Paul ran into that, you know, all of a sudden she no longer had visions and sights and the person got mad and they wanted to kick Paul out because that was all about the money as well. I, I see a similar story here with the pigs. Very superficial, don't get me wrong, but I think as well there is a spiritual application to that too. And I think that's what you know you're you're speaking of there too, Leanne, that you know, individuals they may they may hear what you're saying, but then they may want you to leave if it goes against what they're thinking as well. Very curious, I think, that, that whole chapter. I find it 
curious and interesting as well. Okay, let's go on to chapter 9. And uh, chapter 9 is uh, got a few things in here regarding healings as well. And, and this is where Matthew will reference his being called. Um, and then we'll see Jesus actually not only just healing people from sicknesses, but actually bringing someone back to life. So there's a physical resurrection that occurs. And this was long before Lazarus. But beginning in verse 9, or, or chapter 9, I should say, verse 1, Jesus got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Just then some people, or some men rather, brought him a paraplegic lying on a mat. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paraplegic, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. On seeing this, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus knew what they were taught, what they were thinking, and said, Why do you harbor evil in your heart? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk? But so that you know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, then he said to the paraplegic, get up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe and glorified God, who had given such authority to men. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Later... As Jesus was dining at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, Is it not the healthy who need a, or is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick? Go and learn what it means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous but sinners. At this time, John's disciples came to Jesus and asked, what, why is it that we and the Pharisees fast so often, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus replied, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he's with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, but the patch will pull away from the garment, and worse, tear will result. Neither do men pour new wine into old wine skins. If they did, then the skins would burst, and the new wine would spill, and the wine skins would be ruined. Instead, they pour new wine into new wine skins, and they're both preserved. While Jesus was saying these things, a synagogue leader came and knelt down before him. My daughter has just died, he said, but come and place your hand on her and she will live. So Jesus got up and went with him along with his disciples. And suddenly a woman who had suffered from bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. She said to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take courage, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was cured from that very hour. When Jesus entered the house of the synagogue leader, he saw the flute players and the noisy crowd. Go away, he told them. The girl is not dead, but asleep. And they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, Jesus went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. And the news about this spread throughout that region. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, Have mercy on us, son of David. After Jesus had entered the house, the blind men came to him. Do you believe that I am able to do this? He asked. Yes, Lord, they said. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, will it be done to you? And their eyes were opened. Jesus warned them sternly, see that no one finds out about this. But they went out and spread the news about him throughout the land. As they were leaving, a demon-possessed man who was mute was brought to Jesus. And when the disciples had, had, driven, had been driven out, the men began to speak. 
I'm sorry, hang on. As they were leaving, a, de, a de, demon-possessed man was mute, was brought to Jesus. And when the demon had been driven out, the man began to speak. And the crowds were amazed and said, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, it is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out their workers into the, the harvest. You know, when we look at this, we see again, I think, more evidence and more power being given by Jesus, or uh, examples of power that Jesus had. Um, but, you know, I have this one question here to ask to start with, and it says, you know, what do each of these events that are recorded in this chapter have in common? What do you think is a common thread that links each one of these all together? Thoughts? Bill? I would say authority. Authority? So Christ has authority over physical ailments, over the demons, over practically everything you see here. What else? Anybody else? I'd say faith. Faith? <clears throat> Anything else? Kaki? To me, it indicates he is doing a new world. All the things he did were not typically things that happened. Then he talks about the wine, the sacks, and all that. He is doing a new work. Okay. I mean, I, I agree with those. I mean, to me, what sticks out personally is the faith concept because it talks about the very beginning. He saw them with this paraplegic and by their actions, the faith that they exhibited, that if they took this person and put him there, that he would be healed. He references again, you know, that the blind people, he references, um, you know, this, this whole concept of uh, the, um, the individual, Jarius, I think is later identified in other gospel accounts of the, the, the girl, the daughter that is dead. Um, and, and he, I mean, he just, it's amazing to me that this person was a leader in the synagogue. And you see the, the Pharisees and Sadducees making these comments that, you know, this is all because he's a demon, that he's actually able to do all these things as far as even cast out other demons. Um, and all the power he's getting is coming from the wrong source. They totally missed the point. And, and yet this one individual had faith to believe that even if his daughter was dead, that Jesus could resurrect her back to life as a result of what he's seeing with the physical healings. I mean, that's like taking it, as we'd say, to another level. It's one thing to cure someone before they die. It's quite another to bring them back from the dead. I don't know of anyone that's really been... This, well, I guess technically you've seen some individuals that have been clinically said they're dead uh, that can be resuscitated back. But here's an, at that time, they didn't have the, the, any advances to know that. And, and then you get into the whole idea of what clinically dead means. But here's a person that is truly dead. They already got the funeral processions going and he brings, it, he brings this girl back to life. Pretty amazing story. Becky? Yeah, it is interesting too in this particular case he talks about the forgiving of sins and you know i mean obviously the unspoken answer is that Oh, yeah, it's a lot easier to for, say you're forgiving someone's sin to actually have them be healed and get up and walk. And so, so he says, just so you know that I have the ability to do this, get up and walk. And he gets up and walks. I don't think this was a Benny Hinn, Ernest Angley show going on here. Because, I mean, they, these were real people that saw this going on, and they were amazed and shocked because of who this, you know, these events that were going on. And he didn't pass it. No, he didn't. He didn't. 
You know, I find it interesting, too, that, you know, he tells some people, like the leper, go to the temple, tell them, show them, and then he tells other people, see that no one knows about this. And I think an answer, possibly, is that with leprosy being a communable disease, they need they had rituals and rules to go back to shows so that they would be able to enter into life, enter into the temple and all the other stuff that was a part of their lives. So they had to have that, you know, you're clear, ring the bell, as we say today with cancer, you know, you're 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 clean um, in order to enter back into life. But and these two in, individuals, he tells them, I'm going to heal you. And it is by your faith that you're being healed, but don't go and broadcast it. It is interesting how he would tell some, and I don't have all the answers as to why that is. Could be that he wasn't ready for that area. He was still doing the activities for some individuals, and it wasn't like he was hiding everything. But it is interesting. There's some individuals he says, don't go tell anyone what, you, what happened. Of course, they did anyway. Every time that somebody told the crowd, it's got bigger and bigger and bigger, but it's not necessarily the spiritual reality. Right. Because it's the reason. Yeah. I think that's the issue there. Yeah. He didn't want to, he didn't want to uh, accelerate that. He wanted to be on the Father's timeline. But I think with the priest, to me, it's almost like Jesus handing the priest his calling card. Yeah. Because when the leper went there, that was something that, that was a messianic sign, was to heal a leper. Mm -hmm. So to me, in a way, G, by sending the leper there to go through the ritualistic cleaning and enter back into life, he was going, Mm -hmm. Oh, there's no doubt it was a testimony because he mentions it's for a testimony. Yeah, I think that's part of it too. I'll, I'll ask the question, even though I don't, I can't put it on the screen because I got it mixed up in the wrong slide. But this this idea of the woman in the middle of Jesus going to the uh, ruler of the synagogue's house to resurrect the daughter, we have this little interjected story of a lady, and we have from another other scriptural accounts she'd been 12 years. Then she exhausted all of her funds from a, an internal bleeding issue, and she just couldn't get healed. Some mention the fact she stooped over, but it, she touches the hem of his garment, and and as a result of that, you know, he, she is healed. But he makes a point to say, even though he didn't physically reach out to do that, I think is the delineating factor. He didn't reach out; she reached out. And as a result of her reaching out and her faith, that's why she was healed. And we think about healings as well. I mean, some individuals go through lifetimes of, with um, debilitating diseases and, and ailments, and they don't get immediate healing. And here you have someone who's gone 12 years and gone and seen all these physicians, exhausted all of her financial ability to until Jesus comes on the scene and then she's healed. And I think I think sometimes there's a lesson there for us to see that, you know, we have to pray sometimes multiple times. And it may take years. And it may mean that we actually die. And in that regard, there is a healing that will occur with the resurrection as well. Could it also be that, and, and this was an idea that was reported in an article I read a long time ago, if you go to Malachi, she would have known the scriptures. They were an oral people. They passed on the scriptures orally. Right. And if you go to Malachi 4.2, it says, and she would have known this, but to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. And those tassels that they wore were called wings in that culture. Mm. She would have known that scripture. Very possible. Very, very possible. I do want to ask and get some input in your thoughts about John the Baptist's disciples and the fasting thing. What, I guess, the, you know, I, I've, I don't have a good answer here. I'll be the first to tell anyone. You know, do you think their question is reasonable about why they're fasting and his disciples are not fasting? So on the fasting thing, um Christianity so the, the part that documented better is that Christianity established fasting I don't remember the days like on Monday, Monday or Wednesday something like that 
two days a week. Mm -hmm. to, because at the time, the Jews had a practice of fasting two days a week. Yeah. Tuesday and Thursday. I don't remember what which specific days it was. But um, so it was the Pharisees, they thought this was what they did. And they thought it was part of what you did to be living God's way. It is more of a super, obviously, an added rule. Right. But, uh, but of course, John's disciples were part of the Jewish, you know, faithful Jewish thing until they followed along with it. Yeah. And they were surprised that someone else didn't, you know, show their piety. Right. By fasting this way. Um, and I think that's what it's about. And I do think, I was just looking up Romans 14. It's interesting how much of Romans 14 mirrors the verses we just got to read. But that's where people, it says, and it's about eating and stuff. And it says one person observes a day above another, and another one observes it all alike. Uh, he observes a day, observe it to the Lord, and he who doesn't observe it, does not observe it to the Lord. And he who eats, eats to the Lord, he who doesn't eat, doesn't eat to the Lord. And I feel like that verse is talking about the people that felt obligated to fast two days a week. Mm -hmm. He's saying, okay, that's fine for you. You feel obligated. You're doing it to the Lord. You're actually doing it with a good, you know, you're concentrating on God at the time. It's okay. But that's not part of my rules. And you do not have to do that. Yeah. And if you don't do it out of good conscience, you're all right. I mean, that's sort of a tangential thing, but. No, I mean, that's that's the only thing that's ever made sense to me. That's why I said I don't have, feel like I got a good answer, but the answer I would give is very similar in nature to what you're saying. It was something that was a part of that. The overall archy, or hierarchy of, of their religious types of individuals, and that was their teaching. And John the Baptist's disciples kind of followed in with that, and Jesus did not. And as a result of that, it kind of goes back to the judging and judging by your own standards as opposed to what's in Scripture. And it's hard to find a scripture that says you got to fast two days every week because it ain't there, at least not in the ones that we, the scriptures we have. And so as a result of that, it's almost as if they are saying your disciples aren't as righteous as we are because we're not doing, why aren't they doing what they're supposed to do? And it all kind of goes back to, I think, chapter 7, verse 1 through 3. Um, and the standard you use to judge somebody else and their righteousness. Um, but, you know, if you, it's just like I, I, I let out talking about the Sabbath. If there's certain things that you don't do, and we're not talking about what's in Scripture, but we're talking about your personal thoughts about something. If that's what you do, fine. But don't put that on someone else and say they're less of a Christian because they don't do whatever the little thing is that's not in Scripture but that's what you feel it is. And I think in some regards, that's parallels what we're seeing here with this fasting deal. Steve? Um, also, he's the light of the world and as long as he's with his disciples, there's nothing to fast about. He specifically says when he's taken away, they will fast. Mm -hmm. It's not a time for fasting. For them. Steve, do you think he's mm -hmm. also making a comment, a veiled comment about the danger of religious ritualism and those type of things because that to me that goes back to what you said Neil and and you also uh, Dave about the disciples I think they thought that was reasonable and it was a righteous practice mm -hmm. and I think Jesus is warning we'll be careful of these external things yeah and these ritual like you mentioned these ritualistic traditions which may not be bad of themselves but don't be pointing your finger at someone else who maybe chooses not to do what you do mm -hmm. and, well saying about that Romans 14 the rest of the first chapter which I didn't know this I just saw it I mean I forgot but it's talking about don't judge <laughs> yeah so yeah. it's kind of like both of those <laughs> two topics are in that, that section, section of and also in this section of scripture. yeah Neil. Yes. But also in verse 14, it's interesting. He says, he says the disciples of John says, why do we and the Pharisees? I'm not sure I take it as if they were making a judgment, but he was honestly going, 
when we fast, we walk wider than I feel the need to. And Christ simply says, because I'm with him right now. That's possible. Yeah. yeah, that's very possible as well. That's the other, you know, you're right. It could it could have been very, very innocent in nature, or it could have been judgmental in nature. We just don't know. And that's why I said I don't have a real good answer, to be honest with you. I find it, there's, like I said before, I got more questions than I got answers sometimes. Steve? They didn't know who he was. Yeah. He did. But all these people, they knew who he was. would slowly come to understand who he was. Right. Do you think these disciples of John were now disciples of Christ? It's like, okay, John said, okay, this is the guy you really need to be following. So I wonder if it's some of Christ's disciples, but the ones that came over from John. Right? It is a curious delineation, maybe, because John the Baptist is dead at this time, based on what we see earlier in Matthew. So, I mean, it, maybe it's a, a fine line. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Like I said, I have more questions than I got answers here, but I... I got some ideas and thoughts, but it didn't mean that I'm saying they're 100% right. But I do know the concept that we've been talking about, about judging and using our own standards. If that's the direction, then we got some pretty clear direction of what we need to be doing and how we need to act, too. And, but there's it's definitely nothing wrong with questioning and asking. That's one of the things that, I mean, it's not like Jesus has a strong rebuke either here. I mean, so, I mean, kind of like... like I don't know. Like the old Saturday Night Live, Pat. Is he a girl or a guy? I just don't know. I mean, it's <laughs> kind of strange. I don't have all the answers here. But I do, you know, there's a lot of discussion here. And I think that's legitimate. And why we, why we study scripture. I know that we, we, we don't probably have enough time uh, to really get into some of the parable here given about the wineskin. In fact, I do have that to talk about next Sabbath, by the way. Spoiler alert. But um, I do want to ask the question there at the very end about your thoughts about connectivity between verses 35 and 36 regarding the fact that Jesus sees as he goes through the towns preaching the gospel and, and he's preaching in the synagogues and he's talking out in the public. He's healing people and the crowds are, are he's you know coming around him and we see a part of Jesus that we should all have. And that is compassion, compassion for people. But I, I really like the word. And I, I, I don't know if you guys have different translations and different words, but I like the way the Baroan standard puts it. It says, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. They were harassed. Now, we can look at that. They were harassed because of illnesses, maybe some inflicted by sin, some inflicted by um, Satan. With demons, um, we see that they were helpless. They could not un unwind themselves from this. And he had compassion because of that, because of their physical condition, as well as because of what they were going through emotionally and spiritually and physically. But he also then follows that up with the verse 37 about praying, because there's so many out there praying for more workers. Do you see a connection between these? I mean, it appears to me that he's literally asking his disciples to pray for more disciples, to pray for more people to be like him. And maybe in a very veiled way, I want you to be like me and have compassion for these people. Just a thought. That goes back to the earlier chapters where he's talking about what true disciples should look like. Mm -hmm. And it isn't just following and being able to say the words. It's about duplicating his lifestyle mm -hmm. through your actions and your fruit. Yep. Any other thoughts or comments? Well, we'll definitely stop here. I appreciate all the participation. And um, hopefully this is beneficial. I I get a lot out of it. I don't know if anyone else does, but uh, it is uh, always, I think, good to have open discussion and talk through God's word. And we will pick up next, uh, next month and we'll look at chapters 10, 11, and 12.